It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there, but how can we determine which strategies will best align with our financial ambitions? Well, you've come to the right spot. Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies for building our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Daniel Nichols, and this is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? Fortune Cribs can help. Fortune Cribs helps investors buy short-term rentals in select markets around the country for as little as 10% down with cash on cash returns in the 20 to 30% range. Fortune Cribs will design, furnish, and manage all the day-to-day -day operations, making your experience truly hands-off. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your real estate investing journey, whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your portfolio, Fortune Cribs can help. So if you want to take the next step, go to fortunecribs.com and book your free consultation to see how Fortune Cribs can best help you. Once again, that's fortunecribs.com. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Kim Bays. And today we are the two smart assets. For those not yet familiar with Kim, she is a multifamily real estate investor, having purchased 9,500 units across 27 properties in the past 11 years and several single family properties prior to that. She has grown her company, Exponential Property Group, and its related companies from two, to, uh, two employees to over 160. And Kim has a vertically integrated business model and is prone to starting new businesses when she can't find the ideal vendor to solve a problem. Kim, it's so great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me on, Daniel. Absolutely. Super excited to speak with you today. And usually we like to kick off the show, Kim, by hearing more about you, the guest. So tell us more about your background, your story, and how you got to where you are today in your real estate investing career. Sure. So it was a finance major, graduated from the University of Iowa, uh, spent a little bit of time in Cleveland, and then made my way down to Texas. Um, it, as we often joke in our office, the greatest country in the world. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, I've been in Texas for close to 20 years now. So this is definitely home as it stands now. Um, but, you know, when my when my boys were itty bitty, about six months old, they're 15 and a half now, but when they're about six months old, um, started buying some single family houses. They actually got to spend their first Halloween at a title company. So that's always a <laughs> fun tidbit. Love it. Um, but then as they got a little more mobile, it was harder to drag them into disgusting houses. And so um, took a little bit of time off from that and then moved into the multifamily space a little later on. And so I've uh, been at this for almost 11 years now on the multifamily space. Started with a 77 unit and just kind of grew it from there. Have had as many as close to 5,000 units um, at a single time. And then kind of have been bouncing between 2,500 and 5,000 kind of over and over again, based on market conditions, what we bought, what we sold, um, and what the strategy was for the next acquisition and asset. Love it. You guys, I mean, love to hear that. Uh, you know, obviously Texas is a great state, a lot of stuff going around with there, and especially if you're a real estate person, right? Uh, Texas is absolutely booming. Um, so I kind of want to touch on that for a little bit there, Kim. So uh, let's talk more about uh, your company, Exponential Property Group. What's been the focus of your company? Obviously doing multifamily, but what's been the kind of the strategy there and what markets have you been uh, really focusing on? We've always been vault, value, value add multifamily. Sorry, <laughs> evidently can't talk today. Um, but so really focused on the value add space um, here in Texas. And so uh, in DFW for the entire time that we've been investing and then added um, Houston about a year or so ago. And um, that's been a, a really great place for us to be. It's definitely where I'm comfortable in terms of just the growth of the demographics of the area, um, the companies that are coming in, the job creation that we have, um, you know, obviously recession's probably coming as everybody kind of knows, but I think uh, Texas is more likely to shrug than, than some other places. And so um, definitely like that we're here. Yeah. And, you know, I definitely, I want to touch on that and that you bring that up. Uh, uh, you know, obviously there is something coming on the horizon, right? We all kind of see it, you know, with, you know, what's going on in the economy. Um, and, you know, you're in Dallas and Houston, I think for a lot of people, maybe back in the day, they thought maybe, you know, every city in Texas, is, you know, just Texas, right? It's just Texas. But, you know, that's not the, that's not the truth. Those two markets, DFW and Houston are very different. And at one point, uh, maybe, you know, especially Houston might not have been very recession resist resistant, right? So can you talk about kind of those markets, how you're operating those markets and how you kind of see yourself going forward in those despite what's on the horizon? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think Houston has really 
changed over the past 10 years. I think 10 years ago, it was very much kind of a boom and bust sort of a place um, where everything was very, very heavily dependent on oil. And I think that they've done a great job in that area of really bringing some diversification to that workplace so that there are is a much broader employment base now than just oil. And so there is not the same boom and bust feel to it anymore as there used to be. Um, you know, Dallas has always been very good at that piece of it. And so having that diversified workforce, but I think Houston is definitely trending hard that direction. And as um, assets that made sense got more and more challenging to find in DFW, we were able to find some really nice assets um, with a little bit of price and cap rate arbitrage between the two cities. And I think over time, they're going to trend in, in a very similar direction. Yeah, those are fantastic markets, you know, just with the demographics that are happening, going to Texas in general, but those major cities as well. And I love the point that you bring up about Houston being, you know, more diverse than maybe it was, say, 10 years ago uh, when, you know, it was all oil and gas. I lived actually lived in Houston for about three years, and that was about three or four years ago. And I've just noticed even just the health the, the health, you know, in terms of, you know, health departments, you know, hospitals, all that kind of stuff, all that stuff is just exploding in Houston. So there's definitely more dynamic to Houston than just oil. Uh, it's exploding. So love to see that. Okay. So Kim, I got to touch on something that we mentioned in your bio and it's, you know, um, you're prone to starting new businesses. And I think that's, that's just something that you don't hear everybody say, right? I mean, it's, it's definitely something that you have uh, ingrained in you. So what are some of the challenges you face that have sparked you to be more hands-on and create businesses. And what were those businesses? Um, sure. So, you know, one of the early ones was the materials business. And so we started importing some materials from China originally, and now we import from several different countries around the world, um, but have also developed uh, direct distributorships and partnerships in the U.S. as well to really help beef up our supply chain. And, and that's been kind of over the past, you know, nine years or so that we've been working on that. But we were very, very thankful to have at least a good chunk of that stuff worked out um, prior to COVID and some of the issues that have uh, come afterwards. So um, at least, you know, don't always have refrigerators, but more likely to get them than most people, you know, kind of just all of those pieces. And really, I think um, diversifying into some of the domestic partnerships and distributorships really helped solidify that too, as shipping became, um, first of all, astronomically expensive, and then also difficult to even get done. So kind of having a blend of those pieces and that logistics business has been kind of exciting to, to watch the direction that that's gone. Yeah, that's massive, especially if you, I mean, if that's the business you're in and these are the things you need, those materials are absolutely critical to your business, right? And being able to have, you know, diversification there, be able to get it when you need it is absolutely massive. And I'm sure, you you know, you saw some challenges maybe in co uh, during COVID, but still you were ready, right? And you had you had options. So, so you know, you create a business, that's just one of them, right? So I think that, you know, you've probably created, you know, I know you've created more than that, but that's really a skill being able to create create businesses. This is something you've developed, a skill is creative, creating successful business. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs will want something like that in their life. So are there any foundational concepts that maybe you've implemented for starting and operating multiple businesses successfully over the years? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of it is um, really kind of focusing on the business. At the beginning, it's very, very exciting to start something new. And when you have only, you know, two or three extra businesses on the side, it can oftentimes keep that focus. But one of the things that um, really in some of the new things that we're even starting now um, is really hiring experts and hiring that top talent. Um, so, you know, all of the businesses that we kind of started out with between the materials import that we had decent background in, in that and just, you know, construction was kind of the next piece that was the interior renovations and I can go install light fixtures if I need to and those kind of pieces. And so um, there's a certain comfort level there. But then some of the other ones, while just as essential are not things that I know much about. So we've been um, working on some software development pieces for years. We've got certain pieces that work and a lot of pieces that have taken a whole lot longer than I'd like. And unfortunately, it's one of those areas where I can't just say, here, j just give me that and I'll fix the code because I have no idea how to code. Um, so I think, you know, especially when the, the, the things that need to get done, but that you're not the expert in, um, going and finding that expert, finding that person that knows the right questions to ask. We've done that recently with a director of development that, you know, has, has done so much building and can have all of the right conversations about, you know, just footings for large steel structures that are just things that are a little bit beyond what we've done. We've done some building, but it's mostly been, you know, kind of sticks, not uh, huge steel things. And so as we've gotten, you know, even out on our ranch doing some of the development there and putting up big barns and, um, you know, commercial kitchens and those kind of pieces, really hiring people that know those areas and can kind of take the lead on it um, really helps to eliminate a lot of the learning curve. So yeah, um, and it's also a cool opportunity for some of them too, because sometimes there's people that really kind of 
want to use their talents in a way are kind of sort of tired of the nine to five grind, but either don't have um, the general stomach for it or don't have the capital to really start and do something on their own. So if you can find one of those people that's like can really manage themselves well, knows what it is that needs to get done, can see the problems, can solve the problems and all of those pieces. If you can find that person, you can give them a pretty incredible opportunity to do something that they might not otherwise be able to do as well. Yeah, I love to hear that. And, you know, being able to leverage other people's talents, right? Like you said, you might not have everything, but you might have one piece that'll fit the puzzle, right? So that's, that's absolutely massive. So I kind of want to dive into hiring just a little bit more. You went from two to, you know, 160 plus employees, right? And you're talking about, hey, you know, let's go find these people that had the experience and put them into our business, but there's probably more to it, right? So are there any other fundamental pieces that you, you put into place to make sure you're putting uh, the right people in the right seats? Because I think, uh, you know, with a lot of people, hiring is very challenging, right? You might go through one or two or three or four people before you get that right person to see what are you doing to ensure you get the pe- right people in the right seats? I mean, I think the biggest thing is you have to be picky. You really have to look for right people and people that are aligned that are going to thrive in your culture. Try to find people that don't like the culture of where they are. Um, you know, different fits are, for, are right for different people. And so if you're, I mean, in today's market, it is, I have trouble believing that there's hardly anyone that's truly unemployed that hasn't been fired for cause within 48 hours. I've been mean, joking <laughs> with my employees for the, on that earlier. I'm sure there's somebody really, really great out there somewhere that just has a very unique circumstance, but it's, it's just the job market has been so tight, um, especially in Dallas, Fort Worth. I mean, it's just crazy. There's help wanted signs at every single establishment, you know, now hiring all positions kind of thing. Um, so I think really hiring for culture is what's going to get the next group of employees to really be retained. And I think because there is such low unemployment, it's more likely that you're going to be hiring somebody that already has a job today. And so um, as you're doing that, you've got to look for the people that don't like where they are for a good reason, a reason that you can solve, a reason that based on a different atmosphere or different work schedule or a different location or a different travel implications or different work hours or whatever it happens to be, if you can find somebody that doesn't like their job for those reasons and you can solve that problem, um, I think that's a really, really huge thing in today's market. Um, yeah. I think just if you're only doing it for dollars, there's a lot of dollars to go around, but if, if you get them for dollars, you're going to lose them for dollars. Mm-hmm. So um, I think really, really find the people that you can fix their day-to-day experience with the culture and it goes a long way. That's such a great point, you know, because I think a lot of people, they might have a job and they may be making, you know, really good money, but it might not be the right fit, right? So going out and being able to find somebody who actually fits your culture, you know, what you're doing in your business, I think is absolutely massive. So, you know, you now, that's have- not easy, of course. Oh, yeah. like, I guess that's the biggest thing is it's really hard to be picky. Um, when you're understaffed and you really need help and everybody's drowning and everyone's tired, it's really hard to not hire that next person but it's important to stay focused on and making sure that you really get the right people in the right seats. Yeah, actually, I heard something the other day. It was uh, there was a shift in the, somebody's hiring process that you hire fast but fire faster. And I know that might not apply to everybody, but I just thought it was kind of funny. You know, you want to make sure you're getting you know, the right people in the right seats, and I think that's that's pretty important, especially especially today. So, um, so so you know, you've vertically integrated your business. Uh, you, you mentioned logistics and, you know, bringing that in house and, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, materials, right. Um, mm-hmm. what are some other things that is, you know, being vertically integrated, how has that helped you grow and scale in terms of just multifamily specifically? Just in terms of, I mean, the materials, the construction, the, um, property management, kind of all of those pieces give us a certain priority. It gives a certain control. If, you know, if a vendor's not doing well on your renovations, for example, um, you know, on occasion, you can have a relationship with the vendor where you're like, hey, this crew is great, but this one's awful. Don't send those to my property anymore. And those kind of pieces. But it's hard sometimes, you know, then you're looking to replace entire vendors or whole crews of things versus just there might only be one or two bad apples in the thing. And so um, it is nice when you can kind of fine tune things as opposed to always having to scrap the plan and start over. Um, so I think those that's one of the big benefits of the vertical integration. Um, On the materials business, I mean, huge amounts of time savings by that process. And so um, we service our own properties, of course, but about another 300 other properties besides our own. Um, So we'll go through, walk, you know, each unit, figure out exactly what needs to be in that box for the renovation. And you get one single box that has everything you need at the right number of ceiling fans, the right number of vanity lights, switch plate covers, whatever it happens to be. And so when that hits the unit, you're then then your construction guys, your renovation guys are not running back and forth to the shop all day. They're not back and forth to Home Depot all day. 
Um, that's kind of our big commitment is to have everything that you need in there so that work doesn't have to stop and you don't have a unit that's completely done except it has no vanity lights so you can't see in the bathrooms. <laughs> a little harder to lease that. So, uh, you know, really making sure that they all get done when they need to is a huge piece of the logistics. And so that's what we provide, obviously, for our own properties, but also for a lot of other properties as well. I love to hear it. And, you know, I, just, to, just to your point, really, I remember when I was doing single family properties and I can't tell you how much time I spent going back and forth to Home Depot. It was absolutely insane and maddening. So uh, I know exactly what you're talking about there. I'd love to hear it. And so, you know, being vertically integrated, you know, as, as such as you are, that's really got to give you a leg up, right? In these competitive markets such as DFW and Houston, right? Because, um, you know, there's got to be a lot of competition in terms of acquiring properties, all that kind of stuff. So this really got to give sure. you a leg up, right? Yes, it definitely does provide some cost savings and, and other pieces lets us expand a little bit in terms of what we're able to do price wise often. Um, there's still an awful lot of deals that get uh, sure. that other people will outbid us on and um, hopefully their investors just have very, very low expectations on return on some of these things because they're uh, anyway would make me nervous on some of the assumptions but um, you know there's there's a lot of great properties out there and it's hard to find the right thing and, and so any um, cost and speed advantage that you can get on it is uh, hugely beneficial. Absolutely. So let's dive into the, the current scenario right now. Uh, obviously, you know, everybody's, you know, got inflation, got rising interest rates. Um, you know, is there anything you're doing right now? How is that, are, how are you seeing that impact, you know, your business on your side currently in those markets? Um, I think the biggest thing is just um, the lending market is tightening substantially. We only have one property that's under contract right now. Everything else is already closed and, and done and in the books. And so, um, that part's good. It's going to adjust a little bit in terms of what you're able to do on the lending. I think the biggest thing is people just don't know quite what to do with the current situation. And so where it used to be a very, very narrow field of the offers and options that you had, the terms are kind of wildly different from place to place and, you know, much, much higher rate, but much higher leverage or lower rate and, you know, different spreads at different things and kind of just different views on it and whether or not people want interest rate reserves. So I think that's the biggest thing is really just kind of hunting for the right lender definitely has a has an impact on today's thing. Um, as far as what it's going to do with interest rates, I mean, we spent a lot of time today looking at kind of where rate caps are, where other things are, what um, how much those are likely to pay out. What what do we pay for them? What are the offers on things today? Do we you know do you want to extend things for any loan extensions or not? Do you want to stick with just what's available or you know minimum term on on those pieces? So I think there's a lot you know. It, What's the Fed going to do? How quickly is the economy going to break from what they do? Um, you know, the, there's a lot of interesting questions and a lot of um, a lot of unknowns, I suppose, but uh, kind of working through those pieces. And I think so. I think the biggest thing, especially for somebody that is newer to investing in something like that, is to pay attention to those things, find some mentors, find some people that can help you through some of those answers and at least projections um, on what might happen, because it is it is definitely a, a little bit more of a tightrope market than it was that I was fortunate with to start with back in 2011 when kind of everything was easy. And as long as at least one or two things went right, you know, you would hit your targets easily. Um, it's, it's a little more challenging these days. Yeah, then you're absolutely right. I think, especially like you mentioned for, for new investors, lean on, you know, people with experience, right? Lean on experience for sure, because that's going to be massive, uh, you know, with this shift that's currently happening. So with that, you know, obviously you said that a lot of, on the debt side, a lot of things are changing. Uh, you mentioned a lot of great things there, and I appreciate you going to that level of detail. So, you know, obviously you're probably, your, your underwriting is changing there as well. Are, is your strategy changing at all? Or are you kind of just, you know, going straight forward ahead, just being more conservative? Um, I think the strategy sort of changed last year. I mean, there were, there were lots of threats of tax increases. And so um, really our goal for last year that we were able to execute really effectively, actually, we got the last property sold by December 21st. So um, was really to sell the things that we didn't want to hold for the next two, three, four or five years kind of a thing. Um, you know, recapitalize the ones that we'd held for quite some time that we wanted to hold look for newer assets that we were happy to hold. So um, definitely a little bit of improvement in terms of areas, um, some in terms of year of construction, um, trying to look for things that are gonna have a little bit softer landing on a cap rate perspective um, on difficult times. Now, the flip side of that, I was, I was talking to some of my uh, team members that are newer to the game earlier today. And so really talking to them and they're, you know, they're like, well, you know, but what happens if people can't afford the rents? And I was like, well, 
that is the flip side of the argument. The cap rates are probably going to land a little softer, the newer areas, you know, nicer areas, newer areas, those sorts of pieces. But at the same time, your occupancies are going to hold up better because if you can't afford the brand new stuff, you go to the 10 year old stuff. And if you can't afford the 10 year old stuff anymore, you go back to the 20 year old. You know, so all of those pieces are, are definitely true. And it, it will be an interesting thing to see kind of how all of it plays out. I mean, I think the biggest thing is try to be conservative, really, really watch your operations, especially in this market as things are tightening. Um, make sure you're not getting left behind on the upside or downside on rents, that you're tracking your occupancy, that you're controlling expenses, doing what you can from that front, um, that you've got the best teams you can possibly find on the properties. Obviously, staffing is hard, as we've talked about, but you know those kind of pieces, um, the on-site team matters so much. So really making sure that you're operating well um, can help get through an awful lot of tough times. Yep, absolutely. Operations are key, especially right now. So with that being said, you know, Kim, we talked a little bit before the show. I'm a passive investor, right? I passively invest in multifamily properties, self-storage, all that kind of stuff, right? So I'm bullish. I'm Well, I say bullish, you know, I really like being uh, invested in these assets, these hard assets with, with reputable, experienced um, sponsors, right? Um, and sure. so one thing I've been having a lot of conversations about is, with other investors, maybe they haven't uh, invested passively in real estate, but they're stock investors, or maybe they did crypto or just all 401k, right? And if anybody's paying attention right now, all those things are getting decimated, basically, right? I mean, it's been it's been a rough time for, for stocks, for crypto, for any of that stuff. It's been really bad. So, you know, people are turning somewhere to place their capital. They want to invest somewhere. Do you think multifamily going forward, say, for the next 12, 24 months is going to be a, a better bet, let's say, than, um, than stocks or, or, you know, any of that stuff? Well, I mean, who's to say when the bottom's going to come or how quickly it's going to pop? So who, who knows? I mean, who entirely knows on the stock market? But um, I love investing in real estate. The, you know, I, I do have to have some money in the stock market, unfortunately, because uh, the lenders require me to keep reserves. Um, so, you know, but but it is it's hard to watch, you know, what you've made in real estate disappear overnight with uh, <laughs> various stock moves and other things. Um, so I really like the real estate investing. I like multifamily. People need somewhere to live. I like that I'm doing it here in Texas. Um, the, the general regulations and environment and business climate here are, to me, a lot safer than in a lot of other places. Um, also, just the population growth, I think, is going to continue to help that. And so um, real estate does well in inflationary times. Um it is somewhat interest rate sensitive, but not astoundingly so. I mean, and there are definitely going to be some people that get caught if you've got shorter term loans and you don't have the reserves to be able to kind of get through those pieces. And I mean, it, will there be some cap rate expansion? I'm sure there's going to be, but I don't know how long it'll last. Um, I think there's going to be a decent rebound of things. I think there's going to be continued reshuffling of where the economy is benefiting and where it isn't. And so, um, Still, that's that's where I'd rather have my money as a multifamily real estate than just about anywhere else. I, I totally agree. And that's why I tell a lot of new passive investors or people who are looking to get into that, especially in real estate, it's like, hey, listen, you need to focus on the team and the market. You know, obviously, you know, if they know how to operate that property and there's strong demographics going to that market, that's really what you want to be focusing on. So that's why I tell a lot of investors. So I completely agree with you saying, Kim. Um, so I appreciate you going to that level of detail with that. Really, this has been a great conversation, but I got to be respectful of your time, Kim. Uh, so before we get out of here, tell the listeners, uh, you know, anything else you have going on in your company, anything like that. Um, sure. So if you're ever interested in kind of anything that we're doing on the property ownership acquisitions um, management side, you can email invest at expg.com. Um, so you can either get invest added to the investor list there, or um, also our investor services team is fantastic at figuring out the perfect place uh, to refer you to inside the organization so that you're not just a uh, pop in between different people over and over again with the same question. Um, and then also on the materials uh, supply side, um, like I said, we do supply uh, companies nationwide, primarily in Texas, but we can also get some nice arbitrage on the shipping and sales tax savings um, in other states as well. So we have a lot of um, customers from other states. So that side of the business is existmf.com. So you can just go to that website um, or email sales at existmf.com. And again, um, even if it's not a sales question, but you just have some logistical questions, uh, happy to help and they can refer you out to the best place. Awesome, Kim. We're going to make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes for us to reach out and get a hold of you and, and talk more about that. So Kim, again, thank you again for being on the show. It's been a great conversation. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. 
We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.